tonight. Greatest accomplishment. I'm alive. I stopped drinking. Barbara Carlson survived her alcoholism to become a flamboyant force on city council. But these days, she's making waves with her outrageous banter on talk radio. Did you read CJ this morning? I heard that she buried kind of a dig at you. It's an unfriendly feud between Carlson and the gossip columnist that's been heating up for months. Now, CJ defends her ruthless reputation. I agonize over each and every item. Do you really? Yeah. I, more than is probably healthy. Leanne Chin broke Chinese tradition and escaped from her communist homeland nearly 40 years ago. Today, she's one of the nation's leading restaurateurs. I want a lot for life. And you have to work for yourself when you want that. Those are nice pen lines, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And Charles Schultz, the famous Peanuts cartoonist, grew up in St. Paul and from his childhood memories created some of his most lovable characters. All on a Pat Miles special. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight for what has turned out to be the most impossible special I've ever worked on. It started out calmly enough. We went to California to meet St. Paul native and Peanuts creator Charles Schultz. But a few weeks later, we went all the way to China with Leanne Chin and couldn't get our camera into the country. You'll have to watch to see how we improvised. And then we ended up with Cheryl Johnson, or CJ, the Star Tribune gossip columnist, in the same program with her arch enemy, KSTP talk show host, Barbara Carlson. I mean, I'm lucky to still be alive. So stay tuned, because coming up, you'll meet Babs, the queen of KSTP talk radio. And believe it or not, there are still some things about her you don't know. I'm sweet, adorable, quiet, simple, and I love CJ. <laughs> Open wide and swallow your daily dose of curiosity. Barbara Carlson and Friends on AM 1500 KSTV. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am back in the hot tub with one of my favorite politicians. His name is Mike Hatch, and he has a shirt on that says, I got in hot water with Barbara. Barbara Carlson, the boisterous KSTP talk show host, is doing what she does best, talking. He's trying to save his own ass. That's what he's trying to do. Her mouth has gotten her in hot water more than once this year, so broadcasting her radio show from a hot tub somehow seems appropriate. Like everything else she dreams up, this is a crazy kind of spectacle that generates the attention Barbara so desperately craves. And I am an important person. I'm working on important issues. Queers and that kind of Queers? Oh, just get rid of a him. moment. Goodbye, Jim. See, you mention abortion or homosexuals, and you and I part company. I have no idea which Barbara I'm going to call up because Barbara's reinventing herself constantly. Peter Thiel should know. He's Barbara's producer and morning show okay. sidekick. There are a lot of people that are sometimes very scared to say what's on their mind because they're scared of ridicule. And Barbara is willing to take that chance. She doesn't try and uh, work from a recipe. And when she's when she is Barbara and just herself, she's so sincere that it's uh, very effective. The audience has responded to Barbara's radio realness. The most recent ratings reflect her growing popularity. But last November, she came dangerously close to destroying that success when she was suspended from her job for asking KSTP reporter Carolyn Brookter on the air if she'd ever slept with a white man. That anic was followed by an angry tirade against CJ, Star Tribune gossip columnist who wrote about the wedding plans of Barbara's daughter. On the air, Barbara lambasted the writer as a hostile black bitch. I want to talk about the race thing because the two times you've gotten in trouble have been with Carolyn Brookter, who's a black woman. Yes. And Cheryl Johnson, who's a black woman. Both of whom say that you're a racist. Are you a racist? I don't think that I am really any more racist than a lot of other people, but that's not an excuse. I don't want to at all say that the things that I said were appropriate. I think that they were inappropriate. With CJ, I should have called her simply a hostile bitch. 
The fact is, she is constantly taking cheap shots at people. Constantly. And I wanted to know well, but, how but, it feels but, 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 and but, but, it hurts. Barbara, isn't that what you do too, though, on your show? I don't think that I'm hurtful to people. Giving the governor's pet name for his, his penis, penis was on inappropriate. The air. Is that, that was hurtful? Any, I was is in, that hurtful? inappropriate. Is that uh, hurtful? Did it hurt him? I've said, I suppose it did. But the point is, is that I think that CJ would say to you that she doesn't go out specifically to hurt anyone either. I don't believe that. Because I've talked to her. I've been on the other side. Now, you didn't let me finish something. If you were to call me or if, if Ernie were to call and say, Barbara, cut, cut it out, I probably wouldn't do it. I asked her not to do it. When you're in a public a figure, you're fair game. I'm fair game for CJ. I was a political figure, and I'm out there. My kids are not. For eight years, Barbara served on the Minneapolis City Council. Eight years her constituents and fellow council members won't soon forget. The Kenwood housewife caused a stir, bringing attention to her political opinions, with everything from sweeping the streets of Minneapolis to driving a tractor around City Hall. But the voters turned her down in her bid for re-election in 1989. She chalked the loss up to betrayal on the part of several council members who she said worked for her defeat. But a revealing article in the Star Tribune didn't help either. In the story, Barbara talked openly about her second husband, Pete Anderson, and their lack of a sex life. I thought you did an excellent job on the city council. But I thought that people got angry at you for revealing too much of yourself. When that article came out, people found that very uncomfortable. And that's when the candidates came out, decided to take me on. I know I'm inappropriate at times, and I know that I speak off the top of my head, and I've been called shooting from the hip, uh, but that's, I respond honestly to whatever the stimulus is. Too honestly sometimes? I don't think you can ever be too honest. I think other people can be hurt. I never, ever, ever set out to hurt someone. I think that what I do is talk about things that other people are afraid to talk about, or they find too painful, or they're just reticent about a lot of issues that well, I'm Why aren't about. you reticent? <laughs> I don't know why I'm not. I really can't answer. I've had a lot of therapy and spent a lot of time with shrinks in my life, and I can't tell you why I'm not reticent. I've always been pretty open. Barbara was a pampered child who grew up with an adoring father, the wealthy Anoka lumber baron, Harry Duffy. She was only six years old when she saw her first psychiatrist, 13 when she took her first drink. What I was was a drunk. I was an alcoholic. Her childhood friends remember it all. They were there for the worst, and to Barbara's credit, they are still there today, supporting their friend Barbara, a woman they say they would do anything for. She's calmer and more consistent and more serious about a lot of things and kinder. That's the big thing. How did you finally turn the corner? My friends came to my front door. I don't know whether you're familiar with an intervention, but people are there to tell you that they love you, but also to help you understand that you have a problem. Did the alcoholism, Barbara, ruin the marriage? I think it's very difficult to get through uh, a marriage and survive with alcoholism. Barbara's first marriage to now Governor Arnie Carlson lasted 12 years, but by all accounts, it was a relationship full of pain especially after the sudden death of their first daughter, Kristen, who died when she was just 22 days old. Eventually, the couple had another child, a daughter, Anne, and they adopted a son, Tucker. But it was an unhealthy relationship and fueled by Barbara's addiction to alcohol, doomed to failure. You and the governor don't speak. Right now. Not right now. I, you know, we'll speak. We have been very, very supportive of one another, and I think we will be again. And I just think that our roles right now are, uh, I think he's nervous. About? About what I could say or what I could do. I, mean, I haven't told all. You haven't? Oh, no, I was no. under the opinion that you said it no, all. No, 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 no. I've There's lots more? more stories. Yes, I didn't mean to scare you, Humphrey. Oh, yes. She's always loved that limelight. And it is not a trait her children share. And when the limelight spills over on Ann and Tucker, like it did the day Barbara gave them condoms for Christmas as a media stunt, they were hurt and confused. A lot of things embarrassed me, yeah. I, I, I don't like to um, 
just have all these things put out into the open about myself. It's an interesting slice of life, and that's what Barbara offers, is slices of her life and her opinion, and that's what makes her so much fun. If you ask anybody around her, we all love that about her, but we also all just get driven to the, to the limits by it. But she talked about your sex life, for example, and I remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh, you shouldn't talk about that in the paper. No, she shouldn't, and I, um, uh, yeah, we've had a few words about that, and uh, I tell her that I feel invaded, as in raped, when she opens up things like that to the general public. Uh, but there again, Barbara's going to do those things, and there's no way I'm going to change her. Well, Next said, month, Barbara I mean, I and Martin first, Pete Anderson it's... will celebrate their 10-year wedding anniversary. After their first date, Barbara says she decided Pete was too old and not rich enough for her. But these two opposites no, just, attracted each other in spite of their differences. Life today starts out with a morning card game at the breakfast table interrupted only by Barbara's decision well, to bake some cookies. Here. Well, Barbara, it's not a good time probably to ask you about your diet when you're making chocolate chip cookies. I still don't keep everything down, and I'm certainly not as thin as I would like to be. It's going to be an issue my entire life. You know what sounds great about Pete is he really doesn't try and tell you what to do, does he? I will tell you that he I mean, like me. not eating the... Yeah. No, I mean, off but, your finger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pete Anderson has brought... Well, a tremendous amount of peace and tranquility into my life. What have you brought to his life? A lot of fun. The morning is young, ladies. Let's go. Watch us, because we may pull off. It's got to be the other way, goddammit. Do you have any coffee pots? All right, are we out of here? A little power walking. <laughs> power shopping with Barbara. <laughs> On the weekends, Barbara pursues her favorite pastime, okay. antiquing. And she does it with the same feverish pitch she brings to the radio. But last month, Barbara gave up her Saturday morning garage sale ritual to attend her daughter Anne's wedding. So she's only going to have a curl on one side? And mom loves her dress, so. <laughs> oh, cameraman can't come in here. <laughs> I'm just proud to be your mom. Thank you. I love you. Me too. When Anne was walking down the aisle, um, I started to think of Kristen, who was the baby that died, and I thought, you know, that when you don't ever get over it. It, it, it doesn't, I mean, it's not as painful. So I don't know why I'm crying right now. But you don't, uh, you don't get over it. it it's, uh, I miss the people in my life who are dead, whom I loved. I also think that um, the death of a relationship, the death of that marriage, the death of that family, I think that that is a very, very hard thing. I think divorce, uh, though I wanted it and I knew that there were all the right reasons, I look at um, my divorce as I think even more painful than the loss of my child and the loss of my father. Because it's such a failure. Barbara, what would your dad think of you today? Uh, he'd be proud. It wouldn't have made any difference in uh, what I would have done because he always loved me unconditionally. Is this the best time in your life right now? I'm very happy with this time in my life. Is it the best? Was it um, the best is tomorrow. And I don't regret yesterday, so is this the best there is? It's very nice now. I'm in a very loving relationship. My kids are healthy. Uh, my daughter's just gotten married. Uh, I like my job. I mean, does it, I think I'm in relatively good health. You know, can things get better? No, oh, I'm very happy. Still ahead, CJ's side. Bitch I have no trouble with. When she, when she feels compelled to make it black, bitch. That, she went over the line. And next, for the first time in 20 years, the genius artist of Peanuts cartoons returns to his Minnesota home to celebrate the opening of Camp Snoopy when a Pat Miles special continues. Oh, I've been drawing ever since I was very small.
There is a clause in my contract that if I retire or die, the strip ends. And this was the idea of my children. They, they said, and I love to quote them, we don't want anybody else drawing dad's strip. The fact is, no one could take over for Charles Schultz, for the man is as unique as the comic strip he created over 40 years ago. His characters combine their creator's quirks and sensitivity with a down-home humor that comes, he says, from growing up in St. Paul. When Sparky, kids, that's what his friends call him, wanted. speaks modestly so I, I of his phenomenal you know, success and is clearly irritated when asked yeah, about the Meredith 15 to 30 million Colorado dollars he earns each year from his back. comic strip. You have, as a result of, of your work and the success of your work, become quite a famous and wealthy man as a result. How do you know? Well, I, just from what I read. <laughs> What seems most important to the world's wealthiest and most famous cartoonist is, is finishing days. today's comic strip at his studio in Santa Rosa, California. Do you think people will get this one? Well, I think so, especially if they play golf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how you draw a tree. You have to draw what I call effectively. Uh, the characters must be nice to look at. You must be able to know exactly what their reaction is in the strip by uh, the expressions that you give them. I think I've always been very good at drawing the different expressions. And I still don't know if Snoopy really plays golf or if this is just something that's going on in his head. Somebody asked him once how far it was to the green. He says it's a drive, three, four woods, and a rake. <laughs> <laughs> This must be a grand homecoming for you. Oh, it's wonderful. I haven't been here since, uh, oh, it's been about 20 years. Last summer, Schultz, who suffers from agoraphobia, overcame his fear of leaving home and made a rare trip back to Minnesota. The occasion was the grand opening of Camp Snoopy. Do you have a lot of childhood memories from Minnesota? One of the happiest times when I was small was when we listen to the radio and they would say the temperature this morning is 35 below and the following schools are closed. Schultz grew up in an apartment at the corner of Selby and Snelling in St. Paul. His father, a local barber, worked in a shop downstairs. As a young child, Schultz struggled with his schoolwork and his insecurities on the baseball field. The first team we ever organized, I suppose I was about 11 or 12 and somebody said to me in school that afternoon, I hear we're going to play you tonight. And I said, oh, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, so we played, and we didn't have a chance. We got beat 40 to nothing, which is the foundation for Charlie Brown's losses. I'll never forget that game, <laughs> getting beat 40 to nothing. We were totally out of it, never had a chance. And I think it's very important that when you become a parent, or if you were a teacher, not to forget how difficult life is out on the playground. It's very difficult out there. There's a struggle that goes on for survival on the playground. As things happen to you that color you for the rest of your life. Schultz may not have been the best baseball pitcher in the neighborhood, but he was known as a kid who had talent with a pen, a skill he sharpened as an art instructor at a correspondence school in Minneapolis. By the time he was 24, Schultz had made up his mind. His sole ambition in life was to succeed as a cartoonist. I started drawing little kids one day in 1947 or 46, I'm not quite sure, and uh, somehow it worked. And the people at the correspondence school with whom I was working, my fellow instructors, thought they were kind of good. So I went over to St. Paul and the executive editor there said, sure, we'll run them every Sunday uh, back in the women's section someplace there in black and white. We'll give you $10 a week. As he continued drawing his little folks cartoon for the St. Paul newspaper, the characters began to evolve, taking their shape on the drawings of the homemade playing cards he and his friends at the art school created, and later exhibiting the merriment and fun Schultz and his friends enjoyed so much together. He used to play cards up at Sparky's. He was extremely amusing, very funny, and very, uh, very creative, you know. Frieda Rich, who was also an artist at the school, became and remains one of Schultz's close friends. So 
But it was Donna Wald, the young secretary with the bright red hair, who captured the cartoonist's heart. It was an unrequited love he later immortalized between Charlie Brown and the little red-haired girl. From talking to him and listening to him reminisce, Donna, it almost seems as if he really never got over you. <laughs> Did you know how strongly he felt about you at the time, or was it not until you later saw no, the cartoons? I knew. I knew. That was, it was not easy. I'd give anything if that little red-haired girl had sent me a valentine. Well, Donna, you said Charlie Brown was your favorite character. Why is that? Probably he reminds me of Sparky. It, he just seems like it's his own life that he's writing about. Charlie Brown is a very good friend of mine. He worked at the Correspondence School, and I borrowed his name from him with his permission. I can still remember the day he came over and looked at my drawing of Charlie Brown and said, oh, is that me? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, what a disappointment. I was hoping I'd look like Steve Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Brown made his debut in 1950 after United Feature Syndicate signed Schultz to a contract and changed the name of the little folks' comic strip to Peanuts. Then that summer, I drew the comic strips and they changed the title to that miserable title, Peanuts. You didn't like the name Peanuts? Oh, it's a terrible name. Yeah, totally inappropriate. And, uh, uh, but I don't think they had any confidence in it. I, it was sold as a space-saving strip. Hard at work on his lifelong dream, Schultz settled down in South Minneapolis with his new wife. The couple had five children. Twenty-three years later, their marriage broke up. But the memories are etched forever in the house where they lived. Even today, the early sketches of Charlie Brown and Snoopy remain on the bedroom walls of that Minneapolis home. For the past 20 years, Schultz and his family have lived in Santa Rosa, California, also home to the Snoopy Gallery, where visitors can browse the massive collection of the artist's work. 50,000 greetings yeah. sent to Reagan, the one he liked best. It's wonderful. He, he's a very thoughtful person. Across the street from the gallery is the Redwood Empire Ice Arena, which Schultz spent $2 million to build back in 1969. It was his gift to all the people in the community who, he says, love skating as much as he does. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles M. Schultz welcomes you to this performance of A Christmas Portrait. Every year at the skating rink, Schultz plays host to a spectacular Christmas show where the winter wonderland of his youth is recreated on ice. His daughter Jill comes home each year to skate in the program. Did you have a sense as a kid that you, that you had this sort of famous father? Not really, actually. I always thought it was kind of neat that I would see him drawing and then I would see it in the newspaper. And, but I, never, I never, never really thought of it in the sense of fame. And, and I admire on a professional level that he, a lot of people try to become famous and he just did something he was obsessed with and loved to do and it happened to become incredibly just huge. And, and people come from all over to, yeah. to see this. They come from all over. We really have a lot of fun, and people do appreciate it. They really do. And the impression that I have after meeting you is that you, you're very much a down-to-earth, um, in many ways not at all kind of carried away with, with the success you've had. That's because I don't know how. I would love not to be down-to-earth. I would love to be sophisticated and smooth and charming, <laughs> you know, but I'm stuck with what I am. You know? You're not going to retire from this strip. I think the only thing that would help me retire would be ill health. Although I went through bypass surgery and never missed a day. And I think a cartoonist uh, is very fortunate. If he remains healthy, he or she should get better the older you get. Uh, young cartoonists have nothing to draw upon but other things that uh, people have already cartooned. So there are no cartooning prodigies. It takes a long time to become mature enough to know what life is all about so you can make funny comments on it. I never knew I could be so stupid. I never knew I had so many faults. I never felt so completely miserable. Wait until you get my bill. CJ is known for digging up dirt on Twin City celebrities, but where does she draw the line? Affairs of the heart and other body parts. But first, Leanne Chin. 
She was expected to marry and become a traditional Chinese wife and mother. Instead, she bucked the system and her husband to become a leading Twin Cities businesswoman. When a Pat Miles special comes right back. If you had stayed in Hong Kong and China, what would your life be like, do you suppose? Probably just uh, stay home and take care of the children and be a uh, quiet little housewife. You're pretty busy tonight. Well, here she is, Leanne Chen. They got our Chinese New Year billboard campaign in Edwatch. You can make water taste like a soup. There's another roll of uh, shrimp, that should be enough. Two, four, six. Mm, looks good. Leanne Chen, to her own amazement, is anything but a quiet little housewife. In Minnesota, she and her elegant Chinese restaurants are famous. Today, she operates a multi-million dollar business chain, which includes 10 carry-out locations and a catering division. The author of two of Betty Crocker's top-selling cookbooks, she's a local celebrity who donates her time and her food to hundreds of charities. And all of this from a woman who 40 years ago, poor and uneducated, escaped like from communist movie. China. Leanne grew up in Canton, where her family operated a grocery business. Most of her relatives still live here. But it was decades before any of them saw Leanne again. For over 30 years, she lived in fear of returning to her homeland. Last month, Leanne, though, took her daughter Katie on a visit to meet her Chinese relatives for the first time. I think more than anything, meeting her family was the most special part of this trip. She endured so much, so much that we didn't even realize. I think historically, you know, yes, we knew the Japanese had invaded China where she lived. We knew that they had escaped communism. But until you get here, until you see the effects of what really happened to people and what she went through, what her parents put her through, she certainly is just, uh, has a very strong survival instinct. So, Leanne, tell, tell me a little bit about this photograph. People think of it as Canton, but it's actually not the name of the city, is it? They call him Guangzhou. Uh, this was your dad's grocery store, Yes. Right? In yes, Canton? Yes. In upstairs, that's where we live. It was beautiful before. For over 40 years, they haven't done a thing. You let them get so old. As a child, Leanne lived in virtual servitude, working for her father at the grocery store, riding her bicycle sometimes 90 miles a day to make deliveries for him and exchange his money at the bank. When she was 18 years old, Leanne was sent by her parents to live in Hong Kong, where they had arranged for her to marry the son of a family friend. Leanne and her new husband, Tony, had their first child before they decided to board a ship headed for the United States and his relatives in Minnesota. I wasn't afraid. Uh, I was feel free. You That's felt free? Feel free. You know, I don't think Americans, and probably not even your daughter Katie, can understand that kind of fear, because we've never had it. We've never had it, yeah. It's very really hard to explain that only way you can feel it is you, you are there. We used to do this when we were little. Is that right? We used well, to your mom? And pray, um, our family yeah. on Chinese New Year and um, other. You, you, so you kept those traditions in your family? <sighs> used to. It was more cultural than religious, I think. The city of Hong Kong is an Asian gem, a fascinating international melting pot with a rich traditional Chinese flavor, a shopping and eating mecca. All you do is uh, slice them. Have you tasted that before? Yeah. And, uh, in here, it's really sweet, and the mango, too. Perfect for this food tour from Minnesota, led by a woman who still remembers the territory. I went so low on the teapot, the guy said, get out of here. Oh, no. Yeah. So I said, okay. I, I'm, I'm really good. I'm really good with it. If you see something, All right, I'm you don't know. I'm going to show you the teapot. You okay. come here and see if you okay. can do it. Okay. <laughs> we didn't get our price. We didn't get our price, but that's okay. You're probably going to see another one. Yeah. <laughs> this is doing noodles now, you guys. He's doing noodles now. Ooh, that looks good. 
So do you do you go home with new ideas all the time? You do. Oh, yeah. you know, I figure each time when I get two things, then I it off my time to go to different places to eat and and look at new things because people create new dishes all the time. So once you arrived in Minnesota, Leanne, did you speak English? No, I don't speak any English. I was lucky, our neighbors, it's so wonderful. And we can speak, but we have coffee party every day. And then I start to um, do some alteration at home. And that really helped me, helped me a lot. Then I had to learn how to speak with uh, people. Leanne started sewing for her neighbors to make extra money. And it was her customers who eventually convinced her to teach cooking classes and cater Chinese food. I always enjoyed that to um, do the cooking. I, I like that a lot. I don't really get tired. I can work there hours and hours and just create new recipes and cook and talk to everybody. You just make sure you have enough pieces of meat for eight people. Leanne's cooking classes laid the groundwork for her first foray into the business world. Many of her students, uh -huh. eager to put their money where their mouth was, invested in the first Leanne Chin restaurant at the Bonaventure Shopping Center in Minnetonka. It was an immediate success, but not everyone was happy, and her original partners dropped out. Now, I don't exactly know what happened, but the original people that started with you, there was some unhappiness there. They dropped off and you went on. Well, um, everybody do things different. And they don't think that I want a big business. I didn't dare to dream about bigger. And all my worry every day is making enough money to pay for the payment and pay for everybody and, and that. And that seems taking lots of my energies and my thinking. So I don't even dare to even think about how big I want to be or what. You were sort of learning on the job. Yes. Because I'd never done it before. You know, I know it's, uh, uh, I want to make sure everything is um, uh, customer-like and they will come back. And that's I, what I'm concentrated with. Leanne's business success caught the attention of local food giant General Mills, which ended up buying her company with a promise to take the chain nationwide. The company failed to move fast enough, though, for Leanne, who bought her business back, determined to expand it herself. She continues to travel for General Mills, promoting her latest cookbook, one of the biggest selling international recipe collections in the Betty Crocker line. We're all set up and ready to roll. Okay. My guest is Leanne Chin. What is it that maybe I've been doing wrong? You try to cook too much at the same time. You must be Bob. I am. This you is Bob Taylor. This is Leanne. Leanne Chin. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Fat Bob's Kitchen once again. So I always use chicken broth, no matter you cook meat or seafood or whatever. Look at the fun you're having. Oh, yes, I Other have children? lots of fun. Yeah. Five children and six grandchildren. Congratulations. Congratulations, you don't look old enough to have any grandchildren. Oh, for yes. Sake. Oh, yes. That's wonderful. Do they work in the restaurant? Did they? One, one worked for me. She and I both worked, you know, 16 to 18 hours a day and really couldn't expect anybody but your children to do that so, or your relatives. So. Laura Chin is every bit her mother's daughter. Leanne says eventually she'll turn the business over to Laura, who now serves as vice president of the company. And she's. Um, um, an honest person too, so I trust her and I try to um, um, give her more responsibility. But it, it, it is sometimes very hard for a daughter to work for a mother because the people don't see her ability much as she really can do. What was the hardest thing, Leanne, in all these years? To try to tell my husband that I'm actually go to work um, huge responsibility. I don't think he understand. It was hard. How have you been able to keep that together when you guys have, feel so differently about, about you and your success? I mean, someone even told me that he doesn't think you're a very good cook. I know. He didn't <laughs> even like my cooking. <laughs> he just wanted, he's uh, it, just like it, old-fashioned, just like my father, and keep telling me that if I give you a compliment, then you won't try anymore. 
and sometimes they just get so mad because uh, you know you, you try so hard to please him and you can't. But look at what you've accomplished. Are you proud of yourself? <sighs> um, yes, and yet still lots of worry. And and yet this is the same person who got on a boat and came to America and didn't speak the language and and look at you now. Yes, and that's always my um, uh, thinking that um, try to to do the things people think I couldn't do it. You believe in yourself? I do, and I have to. Coming up next. I want you to stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, for a very, very exciting segment. My very best friend in the entire world, gossip columnist CJ. You know how well she tells you the truth. When a Pat Miles special returns. CJ here. I felt we needed a, a more cheeky, irreverent kind of gossip column. And I have an excellent source. I thought we needed to have more fun. In it. Yuck, 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 yuck. I wanted aggressiveness. I said, so you're telling me that he wasn't in the hospital, doesn't cut the mustard anymore. I know he was there. But did I envision what she's done with it? Absolutely not. There is no hard data to prove it, but Cheryl Johnson, or CJ as she's now known, may be the Star Tribune's most mm -hmm. widely read columnist. She's yeah, certainly yeah, the most that. talked about. And this from a woman who in 1984 was on the brink of professional disaster. Banished by newspaper management to the lowly suburban news beat in Anoka County. Her job was saved, she says, only because Barbara Flanagan decided to retire and she decided to apply for the opening. I knew I could do what Barbara Flanagan had done. No. They wanted something sassy, and they wanted something with an edge, and they wanted something that, that people would, would find must-reading. There's kind of a homogenous group of people who are in the know, who have power, and who have money. And the fact is, there's a huge element of our readership and your viewership who resent the living hell out of that and absolutely want irreverence, want to see uh, people like you and me punctured. Would you say that CJ is yeah, someone <laughs> who well, is one of those people that wants to puncture, as you say, the power elite? I knew that she would not shy away from gossip. Almost immediately, CJ set about changing the rules. Suddenly, everyone became fair game for her column. There have been embarrassing items about almost every Minnesota celebrity, including an especially damning article about Kirk Carlson parking in a handicapped spot. They make a lot of money. They could take a lot of abuse. <laughs> now that, um, when you talk about your column having an attitude, mm -hmm. is that the attitude? I don't make nearly what they make, and I'll bet you I take more abuse than they do. So, so yeah, it comes with the territory. Have you ever been afraid to write about anyone? No. Or anything that you backed away from, for whatever reason? If it's something that I know my editors, you know, don't want in the paper, then yeah, you back away from it. Well, how do you draw the line? I mean, where do you draw the line? Affairs of the heart and other body parts. Because of the job that you have, CJ, you've become more than just a reporter, obviously. I mean, you, you're almost becoming the, the kind of celebrity that you write about. No, never, never, never. <laughs> I'm not going to take this stuff too seriously. I just, uh, I, I, I've always been a reporter, so I've always had access to people. So this isn't that much different to my way of thinking. When you're going to write <laughs> about people, they're going to probably write and talk about you, too. I write a gossip column. I am fair game for gossip. I realize that. I accept that. Um, 
to some people's way of thinking, that means they can say anything they like about me, whether or not they, it's true or they know it to be true. I try to laugh it off. I have a pretty thick skin. Where does that come from, that thick skin? I don't know, Pat. I think that uh, being black in America is great training for lots of different jobs. <laughs> and being a gossip columnist may be one of them. This is one of Cheryl's favorites. Hey, girl. Good to see you. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Welcome home. Thank you. CJ's family lives in Montgomery, Alabama, where she went to high school. She visits her mother and stepfather there at least twice a year. You want water, milk? Yeah, I got the road right oh, Okay. And on this latest visit in February, she was the guest speaker at her alma mater, where she once worked as a reporter for the high school newspaper. I do a gossip column, and I didn't know I was going to do a gossip column when I was working for the Blue and White. She was sort of a general reporter. Of course, this was a predominantly white school at that time. She was right in there, and everybody liked her, and she liked everybody, and they got along just great. There was still a lot of prejudice, but I think it made a, a much stronger person. In, in fact, she can be very sensitive, but she is, she has learned to uh, kind of, what, just keep that soft spot in a shell because she's been hurt. Okay, thank you. Bye. Hot tip. I got a really beautiful racist phone call this morning. Why not you go out and help shoot a few or more of your nigger friends and then we wouldn't have too many of you in 10 years the way you're killing each other off. <laughs> so how does that make you feel when people call and do that? I mean, do you, I don't think anybody has thick skin about stuff like that. I mean, I've... I've been in my business a long time where I get criticized about my hair and I don't like her or whatever, but and that's tough. Well, it's, it's just kind of surprising to me that we're still dealing with this stuff. I mean, didn't we deal with this when I was a child? Why are we still dealing with this? She has taken far more hassle for being a black woman, I think, than for writing the column or writing anything bad about people. But the things that she has been subjected to as a black woman have at times brought tears to my eyes. It's, it's outrageous. One of the racial sticks was stuck by Barbara Carlson. <sighs> I think uh, Barbara Carlson speaks very well for herself, even with both feet and her tattooed behind in her mouth. Bitch, I have no trouble with. When she, when she feels compelled to make it black bitch, that, she went over the line. You two both have a forum. Do you develop personal feuds with people like that? And do you no, think that and you ever... I don't have a personal feud with Barbara Carlson either. The question is really, do you ever find yourself using your column to get back at somebody who's hurt you or done something that you don't think is fair? No. I, if I had... If, if I, had a vendetta with everyone who imagines it, I would never have time to do my job. A lot of that is, is imagined. There are several people, though, who really, in one way or in one fashion or another, blame you to a certain extent for their um, demise. For example, Eleanor Mondale. I'm not unsympathetic to Eleanor, but Pat, I've got to tell you, I never got a stronger sense that Eleanor was not trying to be in the column than when I called her to get her side of some outrageous thing that she had done. I have told my parents I'll move home when she's gone. The former vice president's daughter now lives in relative anonymity in Chicago. Just, she'd call me and say, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, well, that wasn't me, or that wasn't true, or that it didn't happen that way. And she'd go ahead and pray whatever she was, and she can. You know, the, the criticism I hear about the column more often is that facts aren't checked out, that people complain because they feel you write something about them and you haven't phoned them to ask them if it's true. Or if, if you have phoned them and they say, no, it's not, that you go ahead and write that it wasn't true, but, I write, but you write what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, is that fair. Is that a fair criticism? Is that fair? Is that a fair criticism? Well, people, if people are saying to you that I don't try to call them, that's not fair. I do try to call people. If it's some minuscule little thing, if it's, if it's a big thing, you know I'm going to try to call them. So that's, And that's easy for them to say. Yeah. They, they have to say something. When people start to dislike you as a reporter, you must be tough and you must be good. 
I, I think it's a marvelous piece of journalism in the, in the sense that it takes a hell of a reporter and it's awfully hard to do. And I think that she's been able to dig the stuff up. Have you ever written anything, CJ, that you regretted? I clearly have to regret the error that I made involving Skip and Tamara Taylor, which I was uh, castigated for and should have been. And that's where I mixed him up with another guy with the same name. Uh, Skip has a drug conviction in his past, but it wasn't this one. So, so I, made, I made a mistake. And I felt pretty bad about that. Pretty bad about that. Styling my hair. For CJ, life away from the job is literally for the birds. This particular bird named Alex, who lives with CJ in her Minneapolis apartment. The columnist also likes to play tennis. <laughs> and basketball, and like prides this. herself on being something of an automobile aficionado, an interest that took her all the way to the Detroit Auto Show last January. Well, this, this year I did go with a, a group of friends. I don't have many, many close friends, but these are some of my close friends. If something's not going right at work, they're the people I talk to. And I think that what she's doing now, people might think is frivolous, but she probably puts as much detail and, and care into her column now as any journalist would do about the biggest investigative story. Because Cheryl has always had a, a gift uh, for sensing the absurd and appreciating the uh, appreciating that sort of extra dimension that sort of comes out of this kind of, of column. Um, I think she found her niche. I do, yeah. Have you found your niche with this column? Uh, this is a scary thought, but yes, we think we have. <laughs> a Pat Miles special will return in a moment. Excuse me, I'm going to burp. <laughs> Can we use that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you better get away from me with that camera. Come on, Pat, I know you don't have your hands on your face. I'm used to looking like a hell. <laughs> So you can't hook it into my hand. If I hook it behind her, you'll see it though. I don't care. He's been doing this for days, hooking my microphones on my dog. How's that? <laughs> David, you need to get the girls. I love the way your children mind. In total control. <laughs> Betsy, your father is calling you. 